Well, good morning, everybody. First of all, if I sound a little quieter today, I just want to let you know that hotel walls that I'm at here in Omaha are paper thin. And I'd rather not have the guy in the room over next door to me here pound on the wall if I'm getting a bit too loud. So let's kind of walk through this forecast and see how things are shaping up. Coming over here to the uh, central plains, part of the western corn belt, you know, right in here. I'm actually in Omaha this morning. I'll be heading to, I believe it's pronounced Beatrice this morning, just a little bit south of here. I was wanting to just look at the water picture in the central part of the country. The map I've been kind of talking over here shows the last 60 days as a percent of normal. We do have parts of our plains that have picked up 200 to 300%, so two to three times their normal uh, precipitation uh, th th throughout this winter so far, so last 60 days or so. Now this is not, again, to, to kind of bypass over regions that have been very dry. So I'm thinking specifically about sections of Texas or coming up into Wyoming, into North Dakota, this section of the upper Midwest or getting back into parts of Montana. I know you see Montana showing up wetter here, but a lot of this was a while ago in terms of, of, of some of the precipitation. But overall, we would, we would classify this winter as one of those winters that gave us a lot of drought recovery. We can look at it in terms of just the stats as well. So going back to December 1, this is total precipitation ranks by climate district. And there are very few regions around the country that have not seen uh, above normal or in the top half of the distribution uh, precipitation, right? So that's, again, major lack of snow here, major lack of snow across the north and to the United States, but there has been moisture in place. Now, one of the big reasons for the lack of snow across the north and of the United States has been because of this. Since December uh, 1, this is what our temperature ranks by climate district look like. Essentially, we've had one Arctic outbreak that kind of slammed into this area. In fact, it moved into the northwest as well, uh, but that was back, what, January 10th through the 21st. And outside of that time period, very strong subtropical flow, trapping air up into Alaska and Greenland, no big Arctic blocking episodes that lasted a long time or were well-timed with one another to push cold air back into the U.S. And the latest model trends just took the, the event that's supposed to come through here starting soon and just peeled back another layer of it, keeping it uh, from, from, from bringing in really, really cold air for any sort of sustained way. So we take a look at this and then also want to show you that our current snow water equivalent map looks something like this. We've had some snow coming across the Canadian prairie. We, of course, had the heavy snows last week that hit uh, part of the Front Range and throughout much of the Rockies. We had the heavy snows in Arizona, and this is what came out uh, here uh, just in the last uh, 48 hours or so. But a lot of this is melting relatively quickly on, on mild air that's coming back in. I was just looking at it yesterday on satellite right before the sun set. And so you can see this was early in the morning yesterday. And as the sun reached its peak and then started to set and that low curled its way off toward New England, uh, you can watch the snow on the backside just melt away. So I'm keeping an eye right here. This is the mild air that came in and just took it out. It is important to note, look at the little little heavy bands of snow that came into parts of well, very southeastern Kansas, but parts of uh, Oklahoma, Missouri, and even Arkansas here got some of this. But we did watch that low continue to mature overnight. It got pretty tightly wound as it went over the Appalachian Mountains. There were some strong winds reported here. We did have some hail that was reported down in the southeast yesterday as that front cleared through. We looked at the lightning of it. But the sun's yet to rise on the east coast as I was recording this, and we're watching the storm system kind of move its way through New England. So I want to take a closer look at that here in just a few moments. But the last 72 hours of total accumulated rainfall really, again, hit parts of the delta, hit parts of the south, the southeast. It's pushing toward the mid-Atlantic. And these heavy rains have hit an area that we go back to last fall and last summer were very deep in drought, specifically this area right here. So just to show you how much the drought has changed in the last six weeks, we have some places that are in parts of the delta, the mid-south, the southeast, that have already made up to a four-class improvement uh, in their drought. And uh, we need to continue to see that uh, fade away as time goes on. We want to get into spring of 2024 with no drought in, in this section of the country. Now, the way the atmosphere is currently set up with the, the El Nino, the subtropical jet flow that's there now, we're, we're going to continue to see relief, especially the farther south you go. But I'm concerned about the lack of that polar flow. This is the area that we just watch miss out on a lot of this moisture here. So let's 
see if that ever shifts around as well. Okay, today we have a tightly wound low that by the time most of you are listening to this, it'll already be curled off the coast. And so we're going to watch for some strong winds out of the west northwest coming in behind it, being fed out of this high pressure. So, so see how that kind of comes around like that. Another high to the north pushing in. And so strong winds are going to line up along the east coast today. If we take a look this morning, about 450 as I was recording this at the all hazards weather map, still have the winter storm warnings that stretch through parts of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, hitting New York, New Jersey, coming right here into parts of you know Connecticut, Long Island, or excuse me, well, Long Island too, but Rhode Island and into Massachusetts. So the issue I think that we're going to have with this system is how quickly we were able to convert over to snow this morning and then how quickly this gets out. And I have a feeling there's going to be quite a few folks that are going to feel as though the system was hyped up a bit more uh, and it may be under delivered. I have, I have a feeling that a lot of it has to do with the speed at which it made its way off shore. So where did it come from? Remember, this is the system that came out like this and it went in that director, uh, direction. So what it did not do was kind of hook south and roll up the coast. Those are the big dogs that can just absolutely hammer uh, the coast with really, really heavy snow. So a little bit different trajectory is important to think about with systems like this. So I was looking at the radar animation this morning. This is one where we kind of color coded for precipitation type. I was just trying to identify where we were making that shift over to snow through these early morning hours. And we're going to watch behind it a couple of clippers come through the Midwest, but we'll get to that in a second. So I'm taking to some surface ops here. So again, these are just before 5 a.m. And I noticed you're looking for the asterisks. That is where there is snow and the little like number like one over two, that's the visibility. So what I find here is that through parts of Long Island this morning, you know, you come down into most of New Jersey and Delaware, I see that this whole area still has dots representing rain. Same thing for this part of Pennsylvania. So the conversion's happening a bit farther to the north of that. Now it will, this line will continue to press south, but the low this morning, just as I was recording, is going right here, um, you know, just like passed over very close to DC. It's almost south of Delaware. It's hitting this particular region here. It's gonna get out, gonna get out pretty quickly. So if you notice here, the newest national digital forecast database forecast on total snow, these are not the, um, the numbers that we had expected to see where we expected a stripe and through here to get well over a foot. Now there will be places where the drifting gets there, but we maybe um, see the totals backed off a little bit in terms of, uh, terms of total snowfall from this system. So that'll be out pretty quickly. And behind it, we're gonna watch this rather large, um, you know, Omega pattern. It's not a block set up here. It's really more of a split setup here with a large high over a broader low. It's going to send a couple of short waves through the plains here. And as those short waves come through, we'll just see if we can get any snow out of them. But uh, outside of that, this was the kind of event that I was hoping was going to kind of push a lot of cold air out and send it into the central United States. But there's no support coming out of Greenland. And there's certainly strong subtropical flow still pushing in here, which is going to limit the duration of that. What we'll see is the subtropical flow targeting California again. And that'll be our next kind of big shot at uh, where the heavy strain is going to be. So I'm going to pick this up at 6 a.m. this morning, central time. We're going to watch that low curl out quickly. And now instead of lingering till like four or five o'clock this afternoon, we see that it's going to be leaving New Jersey, New York by noon, I think, maybe one o'clock and clear the coast completely by four or five o'clock rather than lingering. Got a little bit of lake effect snow behind it, some light snow coming again. Remember those little short waves coming around the big ridge that's over Alaska, moving through the upper Midwest, excuse me, the Northern Plains coming off of the Rockies here. And you'll just see this evening, getting into tomorrow on Wednesday, that snow spreading out of Manitoba into Ontario, but clipping parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin. We desperately need this. And some heavier snow right here. And this is kind of um, snow that's going to be borne on the cold air that's going to be racing down out of the Canadian prairie by Wednesday into Thursday. So we're just kind of putting the squeeze on the atmosphere right here uh, with a front. And that's where we're going to watch for that snow to spread. So out of the Rocky Mountains, though, in Colorado, there is a weaker low right here. And that's also going to help feed it with some moisture coming around. So I'm just saying, keep an eye in this area for some locally heavy snow. Sliding out of Montana, clipping Wyoming getting into South Dakota, maybe northern Nebraska, but going right across this section of Minnesota, a region that's not seen much snow at all this year. This will then move over Wisconsin, bring rain and storms in the Chicago area, just about the time that I want to be flying home later this week. 
And as that rolls through, we'll hit it at Michigan, and then a lot of our attention will go right back to the West Coast. So this is getting through Thursday morning and midday. Now, if you notice, at that time, we have a deep low that hits Northern California. This is going to be the first in a sequence of deeper lows that's going to hit California, but they're not as strong as they were in the past. Kind of ranking these things, that low shows up right here as a weak atmospheric river. There's another one that'll be on the 17th and 18th, and another push here around the 19th and 20th. So we're just, I'm looking right here around San Francisco just as a reference point. We're just trying to see when we have these next three events coming into the West Coast. Overall, you look at the next two weeks and that flow is setting up with still some subtropical component to it that puts California in the above average precipitation, maybe some places one to four inches above normal, but much of the rest of the country gets a little bit of a break. Where's that subtropical jet? It's here. And the wetter conditions you've got right now, this is from the current system. So we do get a chance to go a little drier in this area and that drier weather not necessarily a bad thing given how much rain we just had. We want to prevent going over to the flooding scenario and staying in the flooding scenario. So I just want to watch for this drier conditions, maybe just to show up, last for a few days, maybe 10, 12 days, but then we'll get back over to an active pattern. So speaking of an active pattern, same narrative as yesterday. I'm kind of uh, looking forward to this. You see here are the branch or the parts of the subtropical branch of the jet stream that continued to hit California. This is the, the second event on the 17th and 18th here. But outside of that coming in, the flow is split here. See that? So that's that northwest winter flow that's just drier. Okay, it's not, but it's not cold this go around. So what I'm watching for is on the 20th, 21st, 22nd. Okay, good subtropical flow, but this is not... What I would love to see is if it curled up like that, but it's not. Do you notice that? It's kind of doing this. That is not how you create big low pressure systems. That's just subtropical flow. So it's going to keep the precipitation farther to the south. It's being met on the northern side with northwest flow. But notice 22nd, 23rd, 24th, there it is again. You see the subtropical branch lives, but the polar branch begins to show up. And I'm excited for what that might mean for March. And that's what we're going to get to in just a few minutes here. Okay, let's compare models. GFS left, European right. This is getting up to about noon today. So we've taken a good look at that snow coming out there. And then watch the little clippers coming across the northern tier of the U.S. right out of Montana into South Dakota. Better model agreement. It gets over to Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, kind of southern Ontario, goes over Lake Ontario and hits New England again with another round of snow right there. Now what follows it? Well, there's that high pressure we're talking about. So another system right here. This would now be Thursday night, getting into Friday. And that one's got more cold air. So do you see how instead of the first low, which skirts like through that, the second one dives. It's just coming farther to the south on the cold air. It's in both models. And there it goes. Maybe bringing some snow down here to parts of Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, coming over to Kentucky. Take note that the GFS has a different scenario. It's taking this right over Chicago by Friday. So see the difference there? But we talked about that yesterday. Remember the GFS with the high here, the European has the high extending all the way down into Oklahoma, and that's why there's more cold air to support a farther to the south low pressure system in the European model by Friday. So already some differences in the models, just out here 90 hours. So take note of that, okay? From there, we're gonna watch this move east. Front clears the southeast. There's our coldest air, and the Discussion goes back to the west, where we just watch early next week into next Wednesday, more systems hitting the west. So can we take a quick look at the west to get the timing? So here we go, Tuesday into Wednesday of this week. That's Thursday into Friday. Big front comes in Saturday. We then have another push on Sunday into Monday, Tuesday. So the west has, over the next 10 days, several events that are going to hit. Watch it very carefully for total precip. Speaking of total precip, let's add it up. Here's the European model solution. We're just going to take this out here for a full week, and we'll take a quick pause right there. So notice we do have the chances here in Northern California of grabbing four to five inches of additional precipitation. We'll take a look at the snow in a moment. But outside of that, relatively weak flow means limited chances of getting good moisture in the midsection of the country. This is the GFS for seven days. So European and the GFS, and the GFS is much more aggressive on the snow in this area. Take a look at what the European model is saying. There's a good chance right in through here of two to five inches of snow. And it's also got one to two inches of snow sneaking down here. 
course, the first system that rolls over the Great Lakes providing the heavies for New England. And then the repeated system sitting this Sierra Nevada and Cascades, we've got a good chance of grabbing a few feet of snow here, which is what we need to continue to cap off this season. The GFS, though, watch this. Much more generous with the snow on that northern branch. Because remember, it takes the second low here rather than diving it down farther to the south. So this is just this weekend, I mean, Friday into Saturday, where we're already seeing a pretty big split. So the GFS much more aggressive here, and then it all builds into New England much more. So take a look at the model comparison. That's the Euro, and that's the GFS. So we better just go over and have a look at the ensembles, and we're gonna look at who's got a chance at getting any snow. So this is the probability of grabbing an inch, and we're just gonna take it out there 10 days. So yeah, we've got some snow in the forecast because there is some cold air. But how much? Let's look at the probability of three inches. Remember, the Euro is much farther to the north here. The GFS has this pushing farther, excuse me, let me rephrase that. The GFS is much farther to the north here where the Euro has it on this map. But the Euro then sends that second system farther to the south. So the GFS ensemble is much more aggressive here on adding snow than the European does. Let's go on up to six inches. Let's take a look at 12. And then notice it's the Cascades in the Sierra Nevada adding the best chance at getting a foot to two foot of snow over the next 10 days. Okay, from here on the wet and dry side of this, let's look at the dry side first. This is the chance at staying under a tenth of an inch in terms of total accumulated precipitation. Now, Arizona and New Mexico just picked up some good snow and good moisture, but I'm still getting concerned about this whole side of Texas not retaining and getting good flow to return good moisture to this area. Outside of that pocket of the Canadian Prairie, parts of the Northern Plains of the United States are drier. Now, if we look at who's got less than a half inch, okay, it's a much broader section of the country here, simply because the flow is split. The wetter folks, this is who's got a chance at an inch. This is the chance at two inches, mainly here into California and Oregon, parts of Florida. Four inches, highest probabilities are here. But there's probably five separate systems, three of which are going to be, you know, weaker atmospheric river events that are going to hit California in the next 10 days. From there, let me just show you the week two forecast. And this would be day 8 through 14, which would be February 20th through the 26th. And again, all three models have the same areas that are wetter and the same regions that are a bit drier. So I like the agreement here getting out there into week two. But you know that that gets us almost to the end of February, and I'll be watching for the polar branch to come out of the Pacific Ocean to do something, hopefully just more fun, in the month of, of March. But before we get there, let's talk temperatures. Next seven days, looking at the frost extent across the country first, and then we're going to go in and look at the timing of that colder air. So here's Tuesday's highs, getting into Wednesday, and then Thursday, there's the cold air that's going to try to sneak in behind this. So notice that we're gonna have enough mild air throughout this week that any snow that does fall is gonna melt pretty quickly. But this is now the extent of the cold air we talked about coming after Valentine's Day. Highs in the 20s. Highs maybe in the teens across the North Dakota, Montana, Minnesota. But then look, Saturday, a brief warm up, getting out there till Sunday, still another shot at some warmer conditions. So we can't really look at this as any sort of an extended shot at colder air. And wait until you see the model trends for day five through 10. I mean, the GFS just opened right back up to warmth like the European was shown yesterday. So only places cooler is Central North America, part of the Canadian Prairie. Outside of that, most of the rest of the country is going to have mild conditions. And there's day 10 through 15. And that now aligns well with the day 5 through 10 forecast from the European and then the day 10 through 15. So this will be interesting. This will be something that the polar jet will likely work with when it gets here in the month of March. And March is gonna be a very, I think it's gonna be a very active month because of the shifting around we're getting. And with the MJO collapsing, that will be, um, that'll be an important component. I don't have a whole lot to add to that narrative today. So we're just gonna kind of push the longer range forecast off until there's more evidence for me to change over what I shared with you yesterday. But I do wanna bring this up. If you look across the whole globe, the coldest air in the Northern Hemisphere is tucked away in parts of Greenland and then a big section of, of Russia. Much of Europe is quite mild. Western, let's go to the southern hemisphere. Western Australia is just absolutely baking. And I'll talk to you about South America in a few moments, but notice how cool it is in Argentina. So where is the polar vortex today? Well, it's had kind of a stratospheric um, uh, increase of heights or warming event that's hit 
on this side of it between Alaska and, and, and this section of Russia and Siberia, but it's currently planted here over the North Atlantic. And this is the kind of disruption that we look out for, um, but weakening in the forecast is expected. And we normally say, well, if it's going to weaken, does that mean it's going to toss down some cold air across North America? But the answer to that, I think, is no. The polar vortex, just watch this piece right here over the next 10 days, stays in that spot. So here's your sudden stratospheric warming. Well, I don't even want to call it sudden, but there's the warming pushing that ridge in. And uh, what does it do? It tries to break the polar vortex apart. But once again, the piece that seems to want to win out of this is the one that's on the other side of the planet. So that's why I think much of the next 10 days, we just keep the coldest air in place here without much of an extension to northern uh, to this side of the northern hemisphere to North America. So you might hear some chatter about the polar vortex. I just don't think it's on the right configuration to deliver any cold uh, for, for North America. Okay, so last thing we'll have to talk about in the long range is going to be the collapse of the MJO. And as it hangs out here, does it emerge back on this side? Because if it does, that's still a more mild signal overall. And we combine that with how warm the oceans are, that kind of you know, El Nino here, warm Atlantic, and these regions that we're keeping a very close eye on, the PDO signature here, the negative PMM signature here, you know, it's not as though these are really cold at this point. So I'm just looking for any supportive evidence of a cold start to spring, and I don't have it just yet. So we'll need to watch this carefully um, as we progress forward. What I want to do is take you next to South America. And what you're looking at here are these Brazilian states, the center west and the northern and northeast growing areas, and their newest NDVI values have now popped up to the highest in the distribution. Look at that. So after all of that drought stress, the rains that have come in lately have really greened this crop up. Now I know they're trying to harvest it, so that's important to note, but they're trying to also plant safrina right behind it. Now let's deselect these, and ah, I'm gonna zoom in so I can do this better, sorry. There we go. And let's go down to southern Brazil. So Mato Grosso do Sul, Sao Paulo, Parana, Santa Catarina, and Rio Grande do Sul. We're hitting right on average in DVI. Let's now go into Argentina. Sorry, this site's a little finicky. And we'll just pick up here. We'll go to Entre Rios, Santa Fe, Cordoba, Buenos Aires. Let's go ahead and pick up this as well. You'll notice that the Argentine NDVI values have kind of dropped off quite a bit here. Um, I think this was due to some of the recent heat and drought stress, but they did get some rain that came through, and I imagine this is going to start to bounce or not really dive too much. So I still don't think that there was a major crop loss out of that event, despite the lower NDVI values. I think the crops just showed a little stress after the heat wave that came through. So we'll watch it carefully. Now, speaking of heat, it's not there now. The next uh, five days are over here. The next day five through 10 is here. So a lot of cooler air coming in Argentina, but it is going to be drier. So the last of the rain moved out and we're going back over to higher pressure, cooler, but higher pressure, good rains in Brazil's Northeast getting kind of toward the center West region and the near term forecast. So we'll leave it at that. I'll talk to you again tomorrow morning. Thanks.